Welcome to the Radical Brilliance Podcast with Arjuna Arda and brilliant guests from around the world who are contributing to the evolution of humanity. Today's guests are the folks from Time for Tribe, who are going to talk to us about the power of tribe. So here's your host, Arjuna Arda. Hey, and welcome back to the Radical Brilliance Podcast. Today's guests are a couple, and I've known each of them for a really long time, more than 20 years. Bill Kauth was one of the original founders of the Mankind Project, which has now spread all over the world. They have 10,000 members, men who are dedicated to a more conscious, generous, vulnerable expression of masculinity. And I've known Zoe a very long time, too. She, she used to, um, to be housemates with close friends of ours. They became a couple a long time ago, and their work together is to do with creating tribe, creating conscious, um, conscious ways of bringing people together that are functional. Now, the word tribe actually is associated very often with indigenous people, with people who, you know, who historically really predate um, our current times. And to some degree, that was replaced by the family. And then after the Second World War, it was really impressed, replaced by individualism, which often leads to loneliness, depression and anxiety. So many of us today, especially if you didn't grow in, up in a really functional, loving, cozy family where you could feel secure, many of us today actually seek out community. We, we seek connections with people. We thrive when we feel connected. But you can't necessarily do that. Uh, just on instinct. You know, if you're born into a tribe, if you happen to be born in the Amazon rainforest in a tribe, fine, you've got your, you've got your tribe. If you were born into a, a large extended family, okay, you've, you're born into that, you just have to go along with it. But if you weren't born into anything like that and you don't want to feel lonely, you have to know how to consciously and deliberately create tribe that works. So this is the conscious creation of something that used to be automatic. And Bill and Zoe have really looked into and tested all kinds of methods to do that in the most effective way possible. I hope you'll enjoy this podcast. It's full of practical information on how to build sustainable tribe. And I'll be back at the end to suggest some ways that you can play this forward. Hey, welcome, Bill and Zoe, to the Radical Brilliance podcast. It's great you guys could join us. Um, we're going to talk today about the power of tribe, the value of tribe, right? <laughs> sure. And uh, I do. know... Go ahead. That's what we do. we would be happy, yeah. to, happy to share that with you. So I know, you know, we live... I mean, right now, we happen to be talking just as the, the coronavirus is picking up steam. And mm -hmm. I'm sure by the time people listen to this you know, months down the line, uh, that's going to have already come to its conclusion. But this topic is, is very relevant this week, but it's also, re it's, it's been increasing in relevance. I think as, as society breaks down, as the socioeconomic system we're used to breaks down, the, the, the power and the value of being there for each other is, is getting more every day. So let's first of all talk about that, about the bigger picture of what do you see happening in the world and why is being here for each other today so much, mm -hmm. such, a, such a powerful topic? I'll take this one. So, um, you know, the alienation and disconnection has been profound uh, in this culture, especially for years. Um, <clears throat> some of us, you know, are old enough to actually remember a small town where, where people had connection. But then our parents moved to Florida and it was all gone. It's like they destroyed it. And it's been going away. There's um, several books, you know, Lost Connections by Johan Hari recently, and uh, Bowling Alone by Putnam from 25 years ago talked about this unbelievable disconnection, alienation, and isolation that our culture is. And within the last week with that coronavirus, it's just exacerbating it big time. So, you know, our, our work has been, you know, healing in so many ways, and we're now going to need to go virtual for some folks. 
I think the whole piece of creating a tribe, it, we didn't start out the idea of, of a tribe. We gift community, we had different names for it, but we realized it needed a certain number of people to make it really work. And we realized tribe was the best word we could come up with to uh, represent mm -hmm. the family-like feeling, the clan-like feeling that we as humans have evolved in mm -hmm. clans. It's just very much a part of our DNA and who we are. And there's been so much isolation, so mm. much separation, yeah. especially since um, the, I guess, the early 60s when people started talking about alienation mm. and a sense that we don't need each other. We're independent yeah. and it's mm -hmm. codependent to each mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. When in fact, mm -hmm. we really do need each other. Yeah, for hundreds of thousands of years, we were tribal beings. We just were. And that's right. deep, deep, deep in us. And it's been, it's been lost by the uh, Western culture, largely. So we Before really we... have this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to just go, and say, go say that we had such a, a sense of the need to be intentional about this. Yes. To really create intentional yeah. new kind of tribe not the old yeah. but something new yeah, that's we, we can't go back to the old way so we had to create a whole new model which we, we'll talk about here as yeah. well. oh that that's what i wanted to tap in with for a minute actually before we go on if i may um that you know there's a notion that ken wilber popularized in the last few decades called the pre-trans fallacy right and essentially yes, the, yes. so the pre-trans fa fallacy it contrasts an earlier stage of development it sees, I'm just saying this so people who don't know what it is. Yeah. It, it takes an earlier stage of development. It looks for similarities with a later stage of development and then makes the mistake of saying they're the same. So a really classic example of, of this would be the way that to some degree, um, as we're trying to refine meaning, we idolize indigenous people <laughs> and, and think that we need to now, we need to learn from indigenous people. But actually indigenous people you know, who are beautiful and, and, and fortunate to have not been through all the stuff we've been through, they don't have the answers to our predicament in, in, in Western society. We can't go backwards, you know? So there are lots of, so I wanted to explore this pre-trans fallacy on two levels with you briefly for a moment before we go into the rest of your material. The first pre-trans fallacy is to do with what you talked about, people living in tribe. Now it's true that, you know, very, like, like, prehistoric human beings lived in tribes, lived in, you know, uh, nomadic tribes. But that evolved, uh, really it evolved into the nuclear family really by the Middle Ages, where the, where the nuclear family became predominant. And then with the Industrial Revolution and post-Industrial Revolution, it became, the nuclear family itself became fragmented. And particularly mm -hmm. since the Second World War in America, the idealization of the individual you know, the, 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 the and, and what do they call it? The American dream, you know, each person's right to, you know, so that would be each guy, each was basically guy at the time, but each person going it alone yeah, and not yeah. even leaving their family, right? Yeah. So yeah. actually now we're seeing that doesn't really work very well, but we're also seeing going and living with your nuclear family is not really the solution. So it seems what we're really needing is tribe 2.0 or 3.0. It's not that we need to oh, emulate okay. the way we had tribes prehistorically. We need a new version of tribe. So that's just one round. And before I bounce this back to you, I just want to give you the, the, the more condensed version of pre-trans fallacy is there was a huge wave of interest in intentional community in the 60s, right? Um, mm -hmm. Who was that guy who took the who did the farm who took the bus from San Francisco from uh, Hay Dashbury? Um, Stephen Stephen Baskin. Stephen Baskin. Yeah. So you know there was this huge there was Findhorn there was the farm there was the Rajneesh experiment in Oregon. So there were there was a huge wave of interest in intentional community in the sixties seventies, which kind of died down and now it's coming back again with a with a you know with a, it's a it's, it seems like a whole new wave that it's not just that the thing from the 60s just kind of continued we seem to have a new wave of interest in intentional community that is fueled by a whole bunch of new understanding so could you comment on on mm. on the, the pre-trans fallacy-ness both looking at prehistoric and current as well as 60s 70s and today okay <clears throat> that we're well aware of that pre-trans fallacy and i i said it real clearly we we simply can't go back to the old way there may be some, you know, some spiritual metaphysical stuff we can pull from the, you know, from the native peoples from, you know, several thousand years ago. But in terms of tribe, um, <clears throat> we we have simply evolved too much as humans, you know, especially you know our generation post World War II. And there's a there's a kind of a consciousness sophistication 
that's simply way different from the uh, <clears throat> from the indigenous people from thousands of years ago. So we're actually deliberately creating what we call tribe as a uh, as a as a gathering of, of extraordinarily conscious beings relative to the you know to the rest of the population that know how to how to create uh, safety between men and women at a level that uh, honestly it hasn't been known before. Um, there's a there's a, a way of uh, communicating and being honest with each other that that's that's unique. And that that mm -hmm. masculine and feminine energies also in, is in so many different configurations. So we include gender fluidity. I mean, mm. this is not just men and women, but it's mm. also those of gender fluidity, mm. um, which is a very important mm. concept that we're working with too. But mm. there's so many different things. I mean, I think also in spiral dynamics, a very dumbed down version of it, mm -hmm. that all these different stages mm -hmm. of development of humanity mm -hmm. um, had their gifts and their appropriateness for the time, um, but that we're coming to a place where we're able to see that the gifts of each one of those stages, the mm. gifts of a sense of magic, the gifts of uh, a sense of hierarchy for certain purposes, yeah. the, the gift of, of that, that everybody is equal, all these different gifts from different stages uh, can be pulled upon, relied upon to create a more conscious moving into uh, yeah. maybe this a new tier of consciousness yeah. mm -hmm. so that's we, very relevant in the work mm, that we're, we're looking mm, at mm. We, we play with the idea of turquoise tribes which in spiral dynamics is very 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 high level an example of using the uh the, the essence of a previous um level of, of being would be um the world view. <laughs> the world view the hierarchy we actually use hierarchy very deliberately as a tool in the building of our tribes we, uh, we choose, uh, and the training we've been doing is with people who are capable of holding a certain, what we call sovereign energy. It's like they're the founders, they're the champions, and they're the ones that then set the base, they set the values, they set the structure, and then they consciously, deliberately choose other people to be in their tribe, knowing full well that after maybe a year or so, the founders will de-roll and become peers. So it becomes a totally leaderless or leaderful tribe with nobody in a, in a hierarchical position. But it requires that, that strong energy to pull it together uh, and invite others into that model. It's kind of like a garden. If you're planting a garden, somebody has got to you know, select the land. Somebody's got to select the seeds and the plants. And there's just this place where people need to be gardening and tending it before they can say, okay, now we're ready to let go of the, the designers of this garden and we're going to do this all together. Great. Could, could we, yeah. Yeah, could we jam on that for a moment? As I know we've got a lot of things to cover, but I'd love to explore, just go a little deeper on that, on sure. that question. of. So it's really what we're looking at is the, the very delicate balance of leadership that can easily spill over into dominance, you know? Now, oh, it could. Yes. It could. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's part of the design that it that it's 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 preordained that they will um, what we say de roll give up their leadership entirely and usually yeah. the fabulous ceremony that goes with that in which the tribe yeah. uh, um, takes the crowns off the king and queen and everybody's totally peers from that point on. Yeah, so right. like our tribe has been uh, we have twenty people on our tribe and we meet weekly, except if we're traveling, and then um, mm -hmm. after about a year. Every, people said, okay, we are really ready for this, what you've been talking about, what you've proposed is that you are going to be derolled and may we derole you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was time. They were ready to take on more responsibility and there was too much responsibility on our shoulders. It needed to be shared for this to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so they did this ceremony and we do bring in a lot of ceremony into our work. And um, so that was like six years ago. Yeah. So now we're just one equal yeah. member yeah. of the and, tribe. And just so you know, that's just this is just pragmatic, efficacious stuff. If you've got six people together and you say, okay, we're going to build a tribe, this community is going to last for many, many years. Now, what are our values? If you've got six people, it'll probably take you a year. If you've got 10 people, it'll take two years just to figure out your values. So what, we, what we've done is we've just accelerated that process by choosing um, what we call the founders of the champions. Yeah. Training well, them and, and they take it. Yeah, I'd love to ask a couple more questions on this point, if that's, if that's sure. okay. Yeah, so because I've been, 
I've been connected to, and I can obviously, when we're talking about this, the main thing I can rely upon is my own experience and people I know, you know, sure. I mean, a little bit from books, but mostly what I really yeah. know is what I know yeah. from my own life. So, so I've been a part of many, many communities at, at, at different times in my life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. I've actually lived with people where we're breaking bread together, sleeping mm -hmm. in the same building. Sometimes it's been you know, sometimes it's been a temporary community where people come together to do a course or a training or something. And sometimes it's been online, right? And what I've experienced over, over my life is frequently I have been in the presence of a strong leadership energy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. who, who just subtly, you know, whether it's overt or subtle, there is an assumption that this person knows a little better, has, has quicker access to the answers. But as you know, from our interactions, I've also played that role myself, you know, and I've, I've been the, the, the big cheese of the, of the community on different occasions, you know. And what I've noticed is, and this is what I want you to get, get comment on, is I love the idea of the de-rolling the de and doing it in a ceremony. That's great. And here I just want to play devil's advocate for a minute, because what I've noticed is the seeds that we carry within us. Uh, both of the need to dominate, but also the need to give power away and, 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 and hand over responsibility. I've noticed it goes quite deep. So I've, I have, I've always felt like co creator You know Carolyn Anderson and, and uh, Catherine Roski, right, who wrote the Co-Creator's Handbook? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, influ they were on our board of directors, and, and I got a lot of influence for them about, about co-creation. And what mm -hmm. I noticed is you can have the intention, I, I've experienced you can have the intention of co-creation of being equals, but even, even if you've consciously decided to de-roll, there are still going to be personality types that thrive on making decisions for other people. And there are other personality types that absolve responsibility. And so what I've noticed is unless it's incredibly carefully monitored, you start to get an imbalance of where mm -hmm. the creative energy is coming from, and sooner or later that leads to resentment on both sides. So can you just comment on that a little bit? Like, in other words, and what I'm asking about is the unconscious elements that fuel this, even when we have the conscious intention to be free of it. Well, so Arjuna, then you just get into another point that we have found is absolutely essential, and that is a agreed upon conflict transformation model. Right. Because we're getting into triggers, and mm. we all have triggers, we all mm -hmm. have shadow. So the, the, the way we've arrived at this conflict transformation model, um, which we started with a model that we taught people, and then once the people were full members, we had brilliant people bring in a, a, another way of looking at it, and we revised it, and we really think it's something special. So with this model, people have to, in the tribe agree and practice this transformation model before we get into mm -hmm. conflict. It's mm -hmm. a great part, part of membership. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that includes the uh, head man and head woman, mm -hmm. or the leaders as well. Mm -hmm. they, we have to agree to that. Mm -hmm. So with that model and with facilitation that people have, trained, have been trained to do, we've been able to navigate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. We call it the conflict transformation because if people actually do it, um, they literally are transformed and opened as a growth step. It's a, it's a combo of nonviolent communication and the Mankind Project clearing. So we've, we've mm -hmm. cobbled together a new model. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to say that, you know, you're, you're, we haven't had anything like what you're talking about in our tribe, but I can imagine it because there's certain personality types that are, um, you know, on, on the Enneagram, you'd call them eights, mm -hmm. that it's very, very hard for them to not dominate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether our transformation model would work um, you know, we don't do any conflict stuff inside the group. We, we, we meet every single week <clears throat> and we have different leadership every week. It's, it's, I, we've mm. been together six or seven years and I've never been bored. It's so exciting. Mm. Just mm. beautiful. Beautiful. And, just, beautiful. and uh, we get into what, you know, we get into some dicey stuff when we, when we try to structure something, you know, mm. like if we're going to change the, the, the day of the week we're meeting, that would be structural and that would take weeks and we do it really, really slow. Mm. So honestly, we haven't had any of that kind of, um, mm. you know, big drama around leadership trying to slide in. Mm -hmm. Good. Not exactly like that. And we also <clears> have <throat> started other tribes, like one in Belgium mm -hmm. has 
been going for a number of years. We did a training there and then followed up with them with another training. And then there's a group in, in your hometown, in Grass Valley, right. uh, a group of people that have been meeting now. Yeah. And we coach them a after a years, training. Yeah. And there are 16 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other groups that are in different stages in Arizona. In, but we're not the only one that are using this model mm. of de-rolling. And nice. Important. And it takes a different headset. Mm, it's like mm. one of humility. You have to be humble mm, to know that mm. this is not going to be a power dynamic mm. that you are going to, mm. you don't want to stay in that position. Yeah. You really want to, the, the beauty that comes from that collaboration mm. is, uh, is, yeah. is, mm. is precious. Sounds yeah. like you're, you're talking about the need. It, what I'm hearing is the need to establish really clear shared values. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. structure. Mm hmm like meeting every week and we have our uh, <clears throat> integrity structure uh, items. You know, let me talk a little bit about, you asked about, you know, intentional communities, which have been around for, you know, 40 or 50, or they've been around for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. But during the, our, you know, our youth hippie phase, it was so popular. And there's a few of them that have actually survived, like the farm, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it comes up all the time as we're telling people we do community and they say, oh, are you going to live together? And, um, you know, we, we've had those fantasies. Zoe's actually done it. And um, when we started, we, we knew that we were going to build a tribe, community, bonded, connected, committed. In our book uh, called We Need Each Other, there's not just a chapter on commitment. There's an entire section on commitment. And we live in an astonishingly commitment-phobic society. So every time somebody tells us they're going to build a uh, community and they're going to get some land and everything will work out just great, we tell them that the success rate is about 2%. And um, we suggest that they probably should build their tribe of humans first and then talk about land. <clears throat> Which people wow. in our tribe have actually done. Many of them have actually uh, divided land and built another house next door. And <clears throat> so there's, there's been consolidation and some mm -hmm. people share a home. Yeah. Um, but we are trying <clears throat> to just cut through all some yeah. of the the pitfalls and, and difficulties we've seen yeah. of people buying land. And it's often a couple or one person who owns the land yeah. and they want to find a way to extend that to graciously include many other people, but the power dynamics yeah. and the, if there is not a agreed upon model for resolving conflict yeah. Uh, yeah. and things mm -hmm. tend to blow up. Can I, may I comment for a moment? Yeah, sure. sure. Curious yeah, about I, I know you've got a bunch of things you want to get through, but so what I, I, I actually, um, I, I would say probably 80% of the people who I know at the moment, uh, primarily in Nevada city where I live, but also in other areas too, are mm -hmm. talking this way, uh, are talking about creating tribe. And mm -hmm. I would say, not all, but the majority are talking about what you've said is very risky is buying land, you know? And I, uh, so there's an, but there's another reason that people are looking to buying land, which is as people sense that the socioeconomic system is becoming less stable, <laughs> yes. there, there, there is actually a wisdom to thinking about how can we grow food together? How can we harvest energy through solar panels? How can we actually create a kind of a small ecosystem that is relatively self-sufficient. So, uh -huh. so that's a different motive, you know, as well as we needing each other, it's actually to do with um, somewhat disconnecting from the, the bigger socioeconomic system. But what mm -hmm. I'm thinking is that what you're describing, because you said the success rate is 2%, you know, what I'm realizing is what you're describing if it, was if it was applied in a physical intentional community could contribute to that success rate going up considerably. Yeah. Yes. I totally support what you're talking yeah. about. And, and, and there are, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of those kinds of echo villages around the country, around the world. And we're on, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're tapped into all that. Uh, Communities Magazine actually ran an article on us mm. uh, a couple of years back being a unique form of community in that we don't live together. Hmm. So the reason that we're, we've got some passion for what we're doing is it's, it's, it's like significantly easier. And when I said the success rate is 2%, I get that from Diana Leaf Christian, who was, you know, she, she actually edited the Communities Magazine for 14 years or something. She knows her stuff, has written hmm. a couple of books. And so she's seen that, uh, you know, for every 100 uh, 
uh, people, you know, projects that get going, they're going to buy some land and have a community, maybe 2% succeeds. So it's, you add the land factor and it just exacerbates the complexity and the difficulty. So we're, our suggestion is right up, you know, build your tribe of people, get your people together. And if they can mm -hmm. love and trust each other and bond and actually make commitments to each other, mm -hmm. then you might want to start talking land. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. so that, that commitment <clears throat> piece is, is big. It's really, if you can commit to the values and, and, and at, yeah. at one point we had a three year commitment when in some of our earlier experiments mm -hmm. and then we realized that was too big to make that three year commitment. Mm. So our commitment, our tribe is yearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll commit to a year. One year. And then there's a recommitment <clears throat> ceremony. Yeah. We do lots of ceremony. We go, we go away for a long three night weekend every single year, all of us, all 20 of us. And, uh, and somebody, creates a, a ceremony for a recommitment in which every person gets to stand up and publicly state it so that everybody knows, you know, I'm totally committed to this tribe for at least one more year and probably the rest of my life. And what are you committing to? I mean, I can imagine one thing you're committing to is showing up for the weekly meeting unless you're sick or out of town or something, yeah, right? Yes. But what, what else are you committing to? To, e to each other, really. <clears throat> yeah. We're, well, we're committing to each other, but we're also, um, because it's residential, this is not a virtual tribe, and we are interested in working more with virtual tribes, mm. given, given the this circumstances week, yeah. that we're in now, <laughs> and also given mm. our benefits uh, that we've seen from virtual tribes that come out of our online mm -hmm. training that we have just done the first one, we're about to do the second one. Um, but that, um, that commitment is, is also to place mm -hmm. for a, yeah. a non-residential tribe where we're not living together, we yeah. commit to the bioregion we're in. And I see. So you, so I, you live, I know, in um, Ashland, Oregon. In Ashland. So you commit to, a, would you say yeah. that you're committing to having a positive impact as a tribe on Ashland? No, that's not our intention. That would be um, <clears throat> uh, a bridging and bonding. We make this distinction between bridging groups and bonding groups. Bridging groups um, get together and then they bridge out, they reach out to somebody, they reach out to work with, you know, kids or homeless or um, uh, other, uh, you know, people on drugs. Those are bridging groups. Bonding groups is all about us, you know. Mm -hmm. Our group together <clears throat> um, focuses just on us for our own growth and evolution and joy in the world. Now, you as a warrior brother, you know that MKP now, Mankind Project, of, of which I'm a, one of the founders, by the way, 35 years ago this year. Yeah. Yes, I know. Um, we now have 10 thousand men that sit in circles every single week every week that's 10,000 groups I mean 10,000 men in a thousand groups and all of those groups are bonding groups they're not designed to bridge out and do anything they're they're all about the men in the group growing and learning and becoming more more potent and more uh, just fulfilled in their life and we've I've watched this now for 30 years as those men uh, make their lives work they get to a point where it's like whoa you know, it's time for me to give. What am I going to give? And in, in Mankind Project, as you again know, uh, Arjuna, is every man has a transpersonal mission. So then they step into that, and then they create bridging projects. I've watched hundreds and hundreds of bridging projects spin out of all of those um, <clears throat> bonding groups. See, it's so, cool. yeah. so we're kind of, but, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about ceremony. You talked about the importance of ceremony. What are some of the some of the kinds of ceremony oh, that you found to be helpful? Well, you know, the, the, the ceremony. I, I kind of feel like we need to talk a little bit more about the other things that we commit to. Mm -hmm. you, okay. You yeah. Good. We need to Go really talk it. about all of that. Mm -hmm. And one of the <clears> things <throat> that we can commit to is um, uh, is respect for each other, gender respect, and respect for oh, men, big. respect yep. for women. And that's a big one. That is a very big one. Um, and also uh, intimacy. That if we, to reduce the sense of the, the, the secrets or flirtation that might happen in a group, because secrets are another thing that destroy community. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a structure, part of the things that they agree to, and the agreements, you ask, what are you agreeing to? is that if there is a change in a sexual relationship, if a, a partner is, is, is changing their relationship, or if a couple want to, are looking at becoming, um, getting together sexually, intimately, that they let it be known to the whole tribe. 
Immediately. Immediately, in the beginning. So there's no secrets. So mm-hmm. we don't have any secrets. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not the same as saying nobody will ever be yeah. sexual with each other, yep. except for couples. Yep. Yep. It, but it's that place of saying, okay, just let us know if there's a change so that, there's, um, so that we, we are all informed of it. This creates incredible transparency. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. one thing that we're committing to is transparency. And yeah. we've had this happen where a couple say, we want to bring it to you. We've decided to separate. We'd like your support. Mm-hmm. And we, they are still both mm-hmm. in our tribe. And we gave them, the tribe gave them so much support. Mm-hmm. They felt, wow, we would have never been able to go through this, get mm-hmm. through this separation if we hadn't brought it forward. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that kind of transparency allows for incredible intimacy between men and women. Which is really atypically new. This is one of the one of the things that we bring forward in our generation. Our parents never would have been able to do this because they mm. didn't have the consciousness, the, uh, mm. the full intention for men and women to be full equals. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it's, uh, the divine feminine has a place in these in this community, in these tribes. And, um, and the divine masculine, I mean, they really show up and we really support each other mm-hmm. and we support mm-hmm. each other in the balance of that within each one of us. Yeah. Um, so, th- and we, we commit also to um, supporting each other's work in the world. Now that's a place where we're yeah. supporting the creations that people are doing out in the other world. Like I do a, a whole piece around um, empty bowl supper that I, I find all the bowls for that. And mm-hmm. a lot of people show up for that every year and in our tribe help make that happen for the last um, seven years. So that another person is a, a campaign that they're doing, a political campaign, we're mm-hmm. supporting them. There's all these amazing things people are doing in our tribe that we naturally support them. So it's one of the things mm-hmm. we commit to supporting each other's work in the world. I'd like to ask a question about these commitments. Um, a big thing that's happened for me uh, since I last hung out with you is I got really involved in partner dance. Uh, that, that, so every week, every Friday, that's my community right now. Every Friday I go and it's called fusion dance and people dance together. And nice. the interesting thing about dance is there's a lot of interesting parallel between what happens in dance and what happens in life, right? So for example, when you dance, you, you generally have a lead and a follow. So the lead, mm-hmm. but if the lead dominates too much, it's not enjoyable. The lead is really creating beautiful invitational spaces mm-hmm. in which the follow can express. So if you get that down, if, if mm-hmm. as a lead, if you learn how to invite your partner to express themselves, mm-hmm. uh, it spills over into life. But what I wanted to bring up is one of the strong commitments and agreements within the dance community has to do with consent right Mm. that basically you don't initiate anything with your partner without their consent so for example there's a protocol for how to ask someone to dance would you like to dance you don't want to dance with anyone who doesn't want to dance with you right and equally there's there's little micro movements you know that when you raise your hand to and your partner's to, for your partner to turn, it's only an invitation, it's not a command, because everything is done with consent. And then there's how close are you dancing? All of this is with consent. Now, what I wanted to bring this up for you is, what I've noticed in the way, that the, the way these principles spill over is teaching somebody something requires their consent. Giving feedback to somebody requires their consent. Sharing mm-hmm. insight requires their consent. Even sharing enthusiasm or even giving somebody a hug requires their consent. So I've noticed that basically any time you impact anybody with anything, you need to first have an invitation. I'd like you to get your comment on that, how important you feel, whether that's shown up in your commitments. You know, our group is not a therapy group or intended in that way. So there's not much uh, of that type of interaction that would require permission. But uh, the little bit that there is, we are enormously tuned into permission and would always ask. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, like even if we're, may I have permission to share something? Yeah. yeah. Mm. There's a lot of permission yeah. and asking permission. And it, it, there's, there's something about oh. as, we, well, as we've gone along and gotten to know each other so deeply all mm-hmm. these years, ah. um, there's kind of this, uh, this experience experience of like we're, we're reattaching we're repracticing mm. this healthy attachment yes. many most mm. of us mm. regardless of our attachment type mm. have 
we barely know what really healthy attachment would be mm-hmm. like because we were raised by parents who had mm-hmm. a sense of that yeah. uh, this culture. So, um, but by bonding and meeting together and being respectful and asking for each other's permission to give feedback, we're very respectful. Mm-hmm. We have Mm -hmm. developed a tremendous amount of of healing of our attachment disorders. So it's a, the the model that we created is really a group of joy. It's not about intentionally being therapeutic. Sometimes somebody will bring a a thing in that's, you know, kind of psychological, sometimes spiritual, and we'll all participate in that. But it's mostly about bonding. And there's something about bonding, as as Zoe suggested, that that heals that attachment uh, stuff. And it's real obvious when uh, somebody in our tribe has got a shadow going on and we don't actively, you know, invite it. We just allow it to heal as it's good and ready. And honestly, over the years, we've watched some just amazing healing and growth. And we're not trying to do that deliberately. We're just trying to create a safe place where people can feel, you know, fully loved and bonded and attached. Is there any, do you have any sort of financial exchange goes on uh, for people to participate in this? Virtually never. Uh-huh. Well, th- except if you're <clears throat> renting someplace. Right. But I mean, when you, when you were initially the leaders before you were derolled, uh, did you do this as a gift to others or was there any compensation? Full gift. Full gift. And that's yeah, when no, you... Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, was, for me, uh, you know, I wanted this kind of a tribe, uh, <clears throat> clan, family situation for so long that I was willing to put my skills forward. And we made some mistakes. Uh, which we tell people about when we do our trainings. We made a bunch of mistakes until we finally found the key that really worked. And everything we did was perfectly, you know, gifted. Because I, you know, after we got derolled, I finally had what I wanted, you know, which which was that place that that felt like, literally, literally, I could fall back into the arms of my tribe and they would always catch me and love me. I've wanted that forever. Hmm. And so I've put uh, my, our (laughs) creative energy into creating it you know now we've created something so beautiful that we're taking it on the road we're doing it as an online course now so we can take it out even broader you said i think you mentioned earlier before we started our call that there are you've been able to identify certain mistakes or certain yeah. things that, that sabotage tribe yes. what are the things that make yeah. it go wrong okay the big one here's the big one is mm-hmm. and i did this for years where i would get into a situation where i'd have a bunch of friends and i'd call them all together and, come on you know People, we're gonna we're gonna create a we're gonna create a community. This is gonna be the most loving, brilliant, wonderful community. And everybody in the in the group would say, Oh, geez, Bill, that is a really good idea. We can definitely do that. That'll be great. And then that group never met again. Mm-hmm. And I went through that same, you know, sequence, like, you know, the the definition of uh, insanity and do the same thing over and over. Mm-hmm. And I finally figured out that doesn't work. And I kind of alluded to it earlier in this conversation that if you get six or eight people together at the start and you figure, okay, what are our values going to be? That's going to take two years if they stay together just to come up with the values. So the model that we've come up with um, is, is a way of getting around all that. And what is and that? What, the model is, is a strong sovereign uh, couple probably. All right. And that means like two people and they bond with each other. They actually have, we actually have written documents with each other right from the beginning, even between the couple so that they start, you know, making that commitment to each other. And then they reach out to a few others and a few others. And then we have a training model also, which uh, trains in, you know, the the gender safety, the conflict stuff, but also a lot of intimacy work, a lot of uh, just standing, you know, face to face with with somebody and looking them in the eye and saying, I see you. Mm -hmm. And then the other one's back, I see you. It's really saying I love you, but um, there's a whole bunch of those intimacy things that we do so that people bonded and connected really, really deep. And then uh, we ask for, we, they actually, then there's a, a provi- for new people coming in, then there's a provisional membership time, three to six months. <clears throat> and when that's complete, then they step forward for a formal initiation into the tribe. And we've kind of come to let them create that. We don't even structure it from the outside anymore. So that's the model. And so nobody, that- nobody can come into our tribe without a sponsor. And then they come in and they go through the training then they serve a provisional membership time, and then they fully commit in as a full member. So Bill has just outlined this whole pro- the, this procedure, um, but I want to kind of go back to that piece where he says this, said this piece about making a mistake of inviting all these people to a yeah. project. And 
it's it's that thing we learned in India. It's all about individual relationships. Mm-hmm. It's yep. all about yep. individual relationships. And that um, if people make an invitation to somebody individually, then that person will hear that in a whole different way mm-hmm. and feel chosen. And they get to decide whether, no, this isn't for them or, you know, this is something they've been thinking about and this makes sense. Mm. The whole way it's been outlined makes sense, but it's Mm. a series of individual relationships. Mm -hmm. And even in our tribe, we realize that after people have been together, we've been meeting weekly, um, still, some of us are getting together with other people all the time during the week and others we don't see as much. So then we have to be actually deliberate about making one-on-one time with other people in our tribe. Mm -hmm. It makes the world of difference. Now you said this starts this this a, a tribe that this starts with a with a man and a woman, right? Pre- preferably, it doesn't have to. No, it, yeah, I mean, people, but what I wanted what I wanted to ask you is how have you noticed if it's relevant whether that man and woman are in an intimate sexual relationship or simply co- co-founders and maybe not in a relationship? It depends on how intimate they are and committed to each other. Mm. We have both. We have mm. some uh, tribes that have started, like the one mm. in Asheville, and it's a series of. Um, yeah, they were not. not yeah, not of that people way. that mm-hmm. none of them are in a in, intimate relationship with each other. The founders, uh-huh. and they have. It's been difficult for them, a little bit more difficult, uh-huh. but they have done it. They have stuck through it, and they're mm-hmm. they are still <clears throat> learning and growing. Um, so it does not have to be. a a couple that's in a partnership Mm -hmm. though that might be, that's maybe more successful that both people have a sense. Yeah, this is my calling. This makes sense to me. Um, Now you mentioned that you mentioned the creation of written agreements. Yeah. Yeah. That's from the very beginning. I mean, so have you ever shared your written agreements with your tribe? The ones that you've created together? They all, they all make the same written agreement. They, Uh You know, we did it with yes. each other, and then every new person that came in, we had this written agreement, so they'd sign, you know. Yeah. Uh, how long is the agreement? Um, it's only one page. It's pretty one simple page? stuff. Yeah. And it's all, you know, pretty obvious stuff. But there's something about the – it's ritual again. It's ceremony. There's something about the act of signing it that just – it's mm. a commitment. It's like, uh, honestly, the, that thing I just went through about the provisional membership is all a series of commitments. Yeah. And it's pretty audacious. <clears throat> Isn't it audacious to somebody said – Hey, I want you to be a really deep friend and be part of this. A little, put a little structure and intention into our friendship. So here's a document. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. what Bill did with me. He he printed out a document mm-hmm. and he gave me this document and I looked at it and it had some, you know, pretty transparent things to talk about. Yeah. You know, kind of stuff you'd want to know about anybody coming in. Um, mm-hmm. Then she gave me the same document. And then and I. Said, I <laughs> took a copy of that and had him do the same thing and it it took that from Mm. talking and talking and talking and talking about this to action it's like you know you're signing up for (laughs) for a very big adventure or for a a weekend adventure that's going to be transformational and you get that whoa now i'm really serious when i actually sign the application and and send it in and so it went from it went from talk to action Mm-hmm. Then we have something else to present to people. Mm. Yeah, mm. it formalizes it. Mm-hmm. Formalizes it as in commitment. So this is kind of an audacious mm-hmm. thing that Bill brought forward, was this actually bringing something from a very old model to a time where the green meme mm-hmm. was completely dominant. Yeah. Like, <laughs> You don't just give a document to somebody to sign if you want to be a friend. Everybody's included. Everybody's mm-hmm. welcome. Mm. And we found that that did not contribute to a thriving community. Yeah. Yeah. You need to have, refine it and see people who could go over that threshold. They, yeah. can, they can go over that hurdle. Yeah. So you might be just interested to know that uh, MKP, the Mankind Project, is probably the first uh, <clears throat> true fraternal lodge uh, in about a hundred years, and so it got me terribly interested in reading about the old lodges, you know, the moose and the elks and the odd fellows and the knights of Pythias, and there were literally half of the population at the turn of the last century in eighteen were in those lodges, and the model that they used was the same model. So it's been used for millions and millions and millions of people successfully, 
So we just borrowed that model, and indeed it works. And adapted it quite a bit. Yeah. because that Sponsorship, was provisional membership, and commitment. So. <clears throat> yeah, but it was really adapted because, of course, these mm -hmm. other models sometimes had uh, flavors and overtones that were not at all in keeping with our values. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. For example, I'm thinking that some of those older models, you know, going back 100 years could be quite patriarchal and, and not respectful of the feminine. Oh, yeah. That, that Racist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we, that's, yeah. we have that. Yeah. We don't have that so, in our values. So for the document that you've got now that exists among your tribe, are there any particular line items that you think might be really interesting to share? Might be surprising. Well, I, I share one. One yeah. was we originally came up with a, one of our values was relationship with divine presence. Mm -hmm. okay. So when we actually had a body that of <laughs> people that had been in tribe for several years, um, they said, you know, I'm ready to revisit the values. And somebody mm -hmm. says, I too would like to revisit the values. That was the stickiest one for everybody. Mm. What? How? Because it it seemed um, it it did, did not set well with everybody. Even though I think I was the one to put that value in there. <laughs> yeah. And so we had a very extended conversation until yeah. we found that the equivalent for people in the tribe that they everybody could read agree upon was a sense of reverence. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That. Yeah. It you know, Everyone could agree to At it. some point, the tribe decided that they needed to rewrite the values. It took months. It was amazing and really, really uh, profound interpersonal process. And when they sifted everything down, when we sifted everything down, all the values, it came to intimacy and connection. Intimacy and connection. That and, was our need. And in January of this year, we met and we, we did a total focus for the whole month just on how is tribe working for you? And every single person was like, tribe is my is precious. It's working for me. It's way more than working for me. It's, it's my family. I love tribe. And then we talked a little bit about intimacy and connection. And from our weekly meetings, we get connection. But the intimacy comes from when we have one-to-one -one connections with yeah. each other. Mm. So we do a lot of that. Besides our weekly meetings, there's all kinds of other, uh, you know, connections with our, you know, with our chosen family. I'd like to ask you um, about, you could say, overflow or implication. Like when you have, now that you've got this strong sense of tribe, yeah. that's really solid for you, how does that impact other aspects of your life? I mean, and I give you, let me give you a few, a few um, things sure. to think about. So one would be, how does it impact your own intimate relationship? Like, how would your marriage be different if you didn't have this tribe than if you do? Mm. Uh, how does it... Now, you mentioned about people being transparent sexually, like if they're going to initiate a sexual contact or end one within the tribe. But yes, how yes. does that... How does having tribe change the nature of one-on-one -on -one sexual relationships? Also, how does it change the relationship with children, with work, you know, in a sense of meaning and work? That it seems like there's a lot of other things in life that would be impacted by having this in place. I, I think that uh, just the fact that uh, I have that profound support allows me a little more latitude in what I do. And I think that's true for just about everybody. We can, we can risk a little bit more in our lives. And, you know, and just like every day, just knowing they're there, just knowing that I have, you know, somebody that's got my back, somebody that, you know, cares about me and loves me. And I know everybody in the tribe feels that. I just talked to you about what we, what we asked in January. So that. In terms of our relationship, I, I think it's, it's been a growthful experience for us. Mm. Hugely growthful. Yeah. Very. I think we're better human beings because of it. It's, um, there's been, you know, we're really in the fire of this. Mm -hmm. We're really in the fire or have been. Uh, I don't think we're, you know, we don't have the power of leaders, but we're still respected for our, our beliefs and our, mm -hmm. what we're doing with our work out in the world of helping other tribe builders start their tribes. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, mm -hmm. we have to take special time, say, okay, we need some just one on one time. Mm -hmm. we, Mm -hmm. take a break and have mm -hmm. this restorative time mm -hmm. but in general it's uh provided a lot of opportunity for us to grow intimately together to be more transparent to be more honest to see each other's shadows and be able to know our shadow territory to each know our shadow territory a little bit um 
like a lot better mm. to know the places where we get stuck. One of the things that I notice um, in my own marriage, but with all of my friends, is we, we are living in a culture where two people are expected to live in a little box together mm. and fulfill multiple different needs all yeah. within the same relationship, right? So you've got to be the person, like, the only person I have sex with and the person I share a kitchen with and the person I clean a house with and the person I pay bills with and the per you know, so many things all within one relationship that it's kind of doomed to fail because there are areas where it really doesn't work well. So and that area that it doesn't work well is often the, 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 the stone in the shoe that makes the whole thing uncomfortable. So I'm wondering, you know, when you have a tribe like this, that maybe you can spread out your relating needs much more among people. Oh, that is people. so true, Archie. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. otherwise we just get siloed in our relationship. Yeah, yeah. And that is a, that's something thing that people have spoken about a lot. Mm -hmm. Now that there's this, it's, it's like instead of just one room, got 20 rooms mm -hmm. yeah. you know 20 rooms that yeah. i can go to yep. right. i can go to um if i'm having a crisis i can go to this one woman and she's going she's an expert mm -hmm. in tapping and yeah. she's helped me through so much stuff mm -hmm. and helped a bunch of other people in the tribe and yep. we tend to gift each other with these exchanges and sometimes we'll also once in a while say no i've just got to give you some money because you mm -hmm. you've helped me so much or give up some other gift but mm. in general, there's this, I've got this mansion that I can go into. <laughs> <laughs> so you got the essence of that, Arjuna, just yeah. the, the, having the breadth of others to go to uh, is really healthy for a relationship. And Zoe and I each are in uh, separate gender groups. I've got my men's group. She's got a women's group. Nice. And in each of those groups, only one is in the tribe. So that, that extends our, our uh, ah, wow. of who we're in with a little bit more. That, yeah. That's fantastic. That's, is there anything else? that you wanted to, I started to ask you what gets in the way, you know, what are the big mistakes that people can make? Is there anything we haven't mentioned yet? Okay, and one of the big, big mistakes that we haven't mentioned. Um, Certainly, I think, the, I love it, that, I love it that you emphasize secrecy so much, because secret, a lot of people feel secrecy is necessary to not hurt people's feelings. But um, it actually, it actually breaks down a sense of that's, that's what wrecks, uh, yeah. <clears throat> wrecks communities. It's not the sexuality, it's the uh, secret. You know, our, our, our group is so small that uh, it, it'd be unbelievably rare that we'd ever need to bring that, that in. That, bring in what? That the concern about the sexuality. No, I was talking about secrecy, not sexuality. <laughs> Any form no, of secrecy. I, I, I understand. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And secrecy is something that we don't want. I think mm -hmm. a big thing is that we have this agreement about conflict transformation. Mm. That is really, and most, most groups do not um have a model that everybody is agreeing to mm. mm -hmm. because stuff is going to come mm. up it, mm. it just it, if with with two people with three people four people with a bunch of people we get triggered yep. and we need that help and so mm -hmm. um that is a mistake that a lot of people don't have that in place yeah. and then also looking again at um what your what your shared uh intent is like in a mm. community, a land-based community, there may be some people that are just focused on creating a solar um, array and, and, and excited about that energy of working with um, the, the sun and, and power. Another one, they might just want it for emotional intimacy. Another one might want just spiritual. Oh, we're going to be just a spiritual group here. Mm -hmm. and we're going to just practice presencing all the time, yeah. all the time. And you need to get clear on what people's intentions are, mm. what their needs are. Mm -hmm. Because that's something yeah, that's where the, Christian that's where the founders need to be really clear. Talks about mm -hmm. the conflict in in uh, her community, Twin Oaks. Is it Twin Oaks? Is that her name of, of mm -hmm. Diane's community? Yeah. Anyway, it's very important to uh, be clear on what your what your need is, mm -hmm. and we identified. We thought it was going to be originally. We did a poll. Uh, the group, the mm -hmm. tribe, created a poll. That what? is important about tribe for you. Mm -hmm. And we thought it would be a social safety net because we've yeah. been looking at yeah. this coming down the line for a long time. We've both been aware of it. That wasn't it. What there was was this need for intimacy and connection. Yeah. Yeah. And everything else came out of that.
that. It was a surprise to us. Okay. You know, and we are a social safety net for each other. Yeah, if any of us loses a job or gets evicted or something like that, we know that there's a place to go. They, we totally know that there's going to be folks that are going to take care of us. Yeah. We know they got our back. We've been to the and, emergency room you know, many with, times. With the corona, you know, coronavirus now popping with, within this week. Boy, I tell you that the need for that social safety net is is going to be up for an awful lot of people. So we wish we could get more people. That's why we're doing the, the, the taking our work out into the world. We know that people are going to need this. So you're actually, I mean, it sounds like you're you're benefiting a lot from what you've created where you are, but yeah, you're also um, you're also sharing this with a lot of other people in other communities. Yes, we're trying to as much as we can. And honestly, it's, it's a lot of work. And, you know, uh, there's times I just like to kick back. But it's, it's so important right now that it's, it's my passion is coming from my, you know, just my caring. I want everybody to have what we have. And it's possible. We've done it. I think Beautiful. what's been most remarkable for me, Arjuna, is how this follow-up group that came out of our Time for Tribe training, um, these are all people from different parts of the world, sir, honey that are creating um, some form of a trust circle, a friendship circle, and this is the beginning steps. They're not immediately going, bam, tribe. They're mm. creating the foundations yeah. for it. And this group is so uplifted when they meet that we've realized um, we have a new focus, and that is helping people with virtual tribes yeah. as well as face-to-face, place-based tribes. Yeah. We've just... We're so interested in just being flexible. Whatever mm. the environment is of the times, we want the thing that's going to work the best for people to really stay together and grow together mm-hmm. and bond and connect. Thank you so much, you guys, for taking the time to talk today. I really appreciate it. It's amazing work you're doing. You know, i got to say, particularly at my stage in life, somehow I'm just in my early 60s, like, you know, I've had a time to sift through all these different ways you can use your life, you know. Yeah. Uh, you can make money, you can try and get a lot of people to read your book, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. it, it really boils down to this, what you're talking about. This is where the real juice and fulfillment is, is this kind of love and bonding you can create that goes beyond the romantic sex you're one-on-one that actually lets people love each other in, in, a, in a feeling of, uh, of togetherness and and. Yeah. and, and Tribe. Thank you very, very much for taking the time. Well, thank Our you. Our pleasure. Richard. So glad that uh, opportunity to share this with you. It's all about love, family, and community. Here we are. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Bill and Zoe as much as I enjoyed talking with old friends. As always, at the end of any of our podcasts, I suggest the way that you can play this forward, that you can make it practical in your day-to-day life. Now, they were talking really, we we talked a little bit about the pre-trans fallacy during the, the, the podcast, and they were talking about the way that you can take something that used to be instinctual and actually make it deliberate. And the the way they talked about that starting is to create conscious agreements. You initially bring those agreements about between the founders, between the people who are starting out with the tribe. So I suggest that you experiment with that today as a takeaway from the podcast. If you're in a relationship, maybe you could take a few minutes to establish just two or three basic agreements with your partner. For example, transparency. I agree to not withhold any relevant information from you. I agree to to tell you what I'm feeling and not to bottle it up. I agree to make agreements clearly and then to keep my word. These are examples of things that you, and they gave many other examples, but agreements you could start to create in your own immediate relationships. You could do this with your family if you live with a family. And if you'd like to create a tribe in the way that they described, you could think about how you could extend the initial agreements you make with one person to include more people. I think that would be a wonderful way to take what you've heard today and to make it practical. And I look forward to greeting you soon on another podcast.